The top stories tonight in Y News. President Rodrigo Duterte has approved a targeted relief for rising prices, providing a 200 peso monthly allowance for poor households for an entire year. However, the collection of excise taxes on petroleum products will continue despite rising oil prices. The coronavirus variants Delta Cron and Omicron BA.2.2 sublineage have not reached the Philippines yet, according to the Department of Health, as the agency warns the Omicron subvariant affecting Hong Kong might find its way in the country. Expect warmer days ahead as Pagasa declares the start of the dry season. And South Korea registered a record daily death toll as Omicron cases surged in the country. Good evening, Philippines and the world. We are now reporting live from Quezon City and today is Wednesday, the 16th of March, 2022. Join us in the next hour as we deliver today's top stories around the Philippines and in other parts of the world. I am William Theo. We are also seen in 1,935 satellite monitoring centers nationwide and via live streaming worldwide through the UN TV News and Rescue social media accounts and our website, untvweb.com. I am Herdine Delgado. First in the news. President Rodrigo Duterte approves the provision of additional 200 pesos monthly allowance for poor households and to retain excise tax on fuel products amid the oil price hike. Meanwhile, the National Economic and Development Authority cautioned against the increase of minimum wage in the national capital region as well as the minimum fare. Rosa Licoz will tell us why. Amid calls to suspend the excise taxes imposed on petroleum products, President Rodrigo Duterte has approved to retain this. This after the Department of Finance presented several measures before the president in light of the series of increases in fuel prices. Apart from this, the chief executive also approved the provision of 200 pesos monthly allowance for poor families for one year. Inaprobahan ng Pangulo ang dalawang rekomendasyon na Department of Finance o DOF kaugnay sa pagtaas ng fuel price. Una ang pag-retain ng fuel excise taxes na ini-impose ng train law dahil ang pagsuspindi nito ay magre-reduce ng government revenues ng 105.9 billion pesos na magpupundo sa mga programa ng pamahalaan. At pangalawa, ang pagbibigay ng targeted subsidies ng dalawang daang piso bawat household to the bottom 50% of Filipino households. We provide targeted subsidies of 200 pesos per month per household for one year to the bottom 50% of the Filipino households. This will amount to 33.1 billion pesos in budgetary requirement. This is apart from the fuel subsidy for public transportation drivers, farmers, and fisher fox. Finance Secretary Dominguez admitted this may not be enough but this is sustainable and affordable for the government. The funds for the additional monthly allowance will be sourced from the higher collection of value-added tax due to the higher oil prices. However, there's no detail yet on when will the assistance be distributed. Meanwhile, the National Economic Development Authority, or NEDA, has cautioned against increasing the minimum jeepney fare by 1.25 pesos and the minimum wage in Metro Manila to 39 pesos per day. Socio-economic planning secretary Carl Chua said this will increase the inflation which will affect not only a few sectors but everyone. Kaya dapat uh, uh, we should uh, be concerned not only for uh, one sector uh, or one type of worker. Dapat po lahat po ay uh, concerned po natin. So ang epekto po nito kung magtaas po yung minimum wage halimbawa at yung mga uh, fares ng jeepney, buses, ay magdagdagdag ito sa ating inflation rate by 1.4%. So yung 3.7% na sabi po ng Central Bank ay expected ay madadagdaga ng 1.4%, magiging 5.1% na. The Department of Labor and Employment is pushing for three-month wage subsidy amounting to 24 billion pesos from April to June to alleviate the impact of the oil price hike to minimum wage earners. 
This is for the benefit of the 100 million workers in the country. On the petitions for wage increase from six regions, public hearings will be conducted in May or June. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. Meanwhile, several measures are being proposed by various sectors to alleviate the impact of the consecutive oil price hike. One of these is the four-day work week arrangement being pushed by the National Economic Development Authority, or NEDA, to conserve energy. Workers will have to work for four days a week and 10 hours a day. While the Department of Energy supports this, it also wants to expand the work-from-home arrangement to reduce fuel consumption. However, the palace said these recommendations are under President Duterte's consideration in the case the situation worsens. Iyan po ay under consideration ng ating Pangulo, ang pong ilang panukala, ang NEDA, at kasama na nga po dyan na nabanggit ninyo na four-day work week at meron din po yung extension ng work from home. At ito po mga panukalang ito ay in case na tumaas pa ng husto ang presyo ng gis sa pandaigdigang merkado. A big-time oil price rollback may be expected next week if the improving situation in the global market continues. During President Rodrigo Duterte's talk to the people, Department of Energy or DOE Secretary Alfonso Cusi said a decrease of 5 pesos per liter for gasoline and 12 pesos per liter for diesel is possible during next week's price adjustment. Ang magandang balita po naman ngayon, itong nakaraang dalawang trading po ng oil sa, uh, sa, uh, based sa Dubai, Ang presyo po ng oil compared to last week, ang last week average po umabot po ng 122.61. Sa ngayon po, sa dalawang araw na nakaraan, 104.79. Kung magtutuloy po itong sa ganitang trend, makaka-experience po tayo ng pagbaba ng presyo next week. The DOE chief attributed the declining oil prices in the global market to COVID-19-related lockdown in China that slows down oil demand, as well as the negotiation for a ceasefire between Russia and Ukraine. The Department of Agriculture announces it will begin the distribution of fuel subsidy to corn farmers and fishermen beginning tomorrow. Rice farmers, meanwhile, will receive a separate aid beginning April. Aileen Cerudo will tell us why. The Agriculture Department needs to balance the situation to ensure sufficient assistance is given to all agriculture sector. Corn farmers and fishermen listed in the DA's registry system will receive 3,000 peso subsidy and a fuel voucher to aid them amid the rising fuel prices. This came from the 500 million subsidy budget approved by President Rodrigo Duterte. The fuel subsidy will be rolled out tomorrow in Tacloban, giving 3,000 uh, per corn farmer or uh, fisher at uh, mabibigyan ito mga corn farmers at uh, fishers ng fuel discount vouchers. For rice farmers, Secretary William Dor explains they will receive aid under the Rice Farm Financial Assistance Program set to be distributed in April. They will also receive fertilizer subsidy to boost their production. Yung no, rice farm financial assistance will be given starting April, first week. At uh, ito yung uh, ayuda na tutulong sa mga pangailangan rin nila. Uh, kasama na yun yung fuel doon. Malaking tulong yun. Meanwhile, the Agriculture Secretary appealed to fisher folk to stop their protests to prevent fish supply losses. Aside from farmers and fisher folk, traders are also requesting fuel subsidy due to increasing logistic costs. They said the high fuel prices affect the transport of goods to metropolitan areas which might trigger an increase in commodity prices. The DA said it aims to submit a recommendation to the national government to prevent any more price increase. Eileen Cerudo, UNTV News and Rescue, we serve the people, we give glory to God. The Philippines has not yet detected the coronavirus variants Delta Cron and Omicron BA.2.2 sublineage, according to the Department of Health. However, the agency warns that the Omicron subvariant affecting Hong Kong might find its way in the country. Aiko Miguel explains why live. Yes, Aiko. 
Yes, Harleen, good evening. Via surveillance efforts are continuously conducted despite the decreasing number of COVID-19 cases in the Philippines. Currently, there are no detected recombinant of Delta and Omicron COVID-19 variants, Delta Cron, in the Philippines. Delta Cron has been detected in Denmark, Germany, France, and the Netherlands. Health Secretary Francisco Duque III also said that the detected BA.2.2 Omicron sublineage in Hong Kong is not yet present in the country. Sa ngayon, Mr. President, wala pang uh, uh, natutuklasan na BA.2.2 uh, sublineage na mga samples na nasequence ng Philippine Genome Center sa ating bansa. Pero patuloy po tayo nagbabantay. However, Harleen, there's a great chance that BA.2.2 Omicron sublineage can enter the Philippines because Hong Kong is a neighboring country with a resurgence of COVID-19 cases caused by BA.2.2. There is a possibility, Mr. President, although nanggaling po tayo sa BA, yung pong search natin, uh, BA.2. So, hindi pa natin masabi kung uh, ito ba ay magdudulot ng uh, Ganon na uh, kaseryosong uh, uh, pangyayari katulad sa Hong Kong. Secretary Duque emphasized the importance of a high vaccination coverage, especially among the elderly population, to protect them from new COVID-19 variants and sublineages like BA.2.2. Based on the DOH's report, there are already 6.5 million fully vaccinated and 1.9 million boosted senior citizens in the country. Secretary Duque said Hong Kong has a vaccination rate of 33% among the senior citizens. Ito naman yung variant na uh, sublineage ng uh, BA2 uh, nagkaroon ng 2.2 pa. No? So sublineage po ito uh, uh, ng uh, Omicron. At uh, ito po ay uh, designate lamang nitong uh, nakaraan linggo, March 7, at uh, ayon po sa mga ilan researchers, karamihan ang kaso ng Omicron variant sa Hong Kong na kung saan sumisipa po ang uh, kaso ay uh, mula po sa sub-lineage BA2.2 at kasabay nito ang uh, nasabi na uh, uh, variant ay nakitang tumataas rin ang bilang sa UK at iba pang uh, bansa. Meanwhile, Harleen Philippine College of Chess Physicians President Dr. Imelda Mateo said that a second booster COVID-19 shot will give protection to those moderately or severely immunocompromised individuals during a possible surge caused by emerging COVID-19 variants. Especially those who had the severe form and critical form na nag-survive, nakikita namin yung long-term sequelae sa lungs. No? Nagkakaroon sila ng shortness of breath, nagkakaroon sila ng uh, chronic cough, no? chronic sputum production. So, and we call this, initially we call it the COVID long haul. I hope by this time nakuha nyo na yung first booster shot nyo. So kung hindi pa, get them. Kasi baka mamaya lumabas na yung advisory na pwede na tayo sa second booster or support those. Arlene Health experts remind the public to get their booster shot. Administration of second booster dose or fourth dose is being reviewed by all, by, um, by all experts group in the country. The country's vaccine expert panel earlier this month recommended for another booster dose for healthcare workers, senior citizens, and immunocompromised individuals. And that is the latest live. Back to you, Arlene. Thank you, Aiko Miguel, reporting live from Quezon City. And in other news, hotter days are expected in the coming days according to Pagasa as the dry season officially begins. JP Nunez has the story. The Philippine Atmospheric Geophysical and Astronomical Services Administration or Pagasa reminds the public to drink plenty of water to avoid heat stress which may lead to heat strokes. This after the State Weather Bureau officially declares the start of the dry season in the Philippines. According to Pagasa, the Northeast Monsoon or Amihan season which brings rainfall has ended. Ngayon lang nagpadlabas tayo ng official announcement na Mag-umpisa ng ating tag-init, ibig sabihin na yung ating amihan ay na-terminate na. The day-to-day -day rainfall distribution across the country will be influenced mostly by easterlies and localized thunderstorms. 
Pag-asa Administrator Dr. Vicente Malano said they will continue to monitor the motion of dry season for the projection of highest heat index it could reach until the month of May. Kadalasan naman ang ating na-experience ay hanggang 35-36 degrees. Pinakamainit nitong or less than siguro itong mga panahon na to dahil mayroon pa tayong laninya. So maaring umabot ng 36 or 35 degrees Celsius ating temperature na mararanasan. Sa heat index ay eh, masyadong variable ito. Titingnan na lang natin kung anong makikita natin araw-araw kasi depende ito sa motion ng ating uh, mga movement ng mga systems. On March 6, the Gupan City recorded the highest heat index in 2022 at 51 degrees Celsius. JP Nunez, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. Mission on Elections or COMELEC is set to conduct a random testing of ballots next week. The poll body also urges all political parties to join the event. Dante Amento tells us why. Amid questions on the integrity of the official ballots for the 2022 polls, the Commission on Elections will invite the public, including political parties, observers, citizens' arms, to join the random ballot testing next week at the National Printing Office or NPO. Para lang masample natin kung talagang siya ay uh, papasok sa mga, mga makina. Number one, number two, kung talagang tatanggapin ng mga makina. At number three, kung talagang mabibilang siya ng mga makina. Commissioner George Irwin Garcia said even without a formal request from any party, the commission will have the testing of ballots and vote counting machine or VCM. The Comelec Education and Information Division will be directed to release the guidelines. Kung pwede, yung lahat ng political parties, lalong-lalo na yung kanilang mga abogado, ang siyang pupunta dito sa NPO. At uh, katulad na nangyari kahapon doon sa, sa vote counting machine, sila rin mismo ang pipili ng mga uh, balota na nakaimpaki na para makuha at yung mga balota yon ang itetest natin. Kukuha ng ilang sample, kahit tatlo hanggang lima, kahit ilang piraso. Vice President Lenny Robredo's legal counsel, Attorney Romulo Macalintal, yesterday disclosed they will demand the testing of ballots, particularly those previously printed without witnesses. Para ang lahat ng mga kandidato na bigyan ng pagkakaroon, na makita kung talagang ang pinipit ng mga balota ay yung talagang balota ang gagamitin sa halalan. So paano kayo tayo makakatiyak na this is really the official ballots? Uh, sabi na, there is no use crying over spilled milk. Meanwhile, Comedag Chairman Saidamin Pangarungan has assured to maintain the sanctity of the ballots by all means which represent the Filipinos' votes. I can assure you that itong election po ay gagawin namin ang lahat ng aming makakaya na makaroon tayo ng malinis, free and credible, honest election sa May 9, 2022. Dante Amento, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. Kamala Commissioner George Irvin Garcia disclosed that the OnBank has approved during today's session the recalibrated rules for campaigning under Resolution 10732. The amendment will be released through a resolution. Under the new rules, permit from the Kamala Campaign Committee or CCC will no longer be required on areas under Alert Level 1 and 2. 100% capacity of participants for venues will also be allowed in areas under Alert Level 1 and 75% in areas under alert level two. Meanwhile, presidential candidate Ferdinand Bongbong Marcos Jr. is not bothered that President Rodrigo Duterte prefers another lawyer to be his successor. Nel Maribohok will tell us why. Ferdinand Bongbong Marcos Jr. respects President Rodrigo Duterte's statement regarding his preferred successor. According to Marcos Jr., he is not worried that President Duterte wants another lawyer to be the country's next president. No, that's his, that's what he thinks. Uh, having be, be, because he is a lawyer, and it, uh, I'm sure he found the the fact that he was a lawyer that he found that his legal training to be of use to him, and that's why he's saying that. Um, 
But uh, it's not necessarily the case also. But that, 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 yun, yun ang, pero marami, marami pang ibang sinabi ni si Pangulo. Kaya alam mo naman si PRRD, talagang, uh, he's a, he was, let's, just, let's just say he's a, he's a very seasoned politician. In an interview over the weekend, Duterte said the next president should be compassionate and preferably a lawyer. There are only two lawyers among the presidential candidates, Vice President Lenny Robredo and Jose Montemayor Jr., also a medical doctor. When asked if his camp was still courting the president for an endorsement, Marcos said he is still hopeful for the president's backing. I, I, I don't know if you could call it actively courting, but we are hoping uh, that he will come out with, a, with, a, with, an, in, with an endorsement. Uh, endorsing at least to solidify and to unite the administration side of the political aisle uh, before, before the elections. President Duterte previously said he is not endorsing any presidential candidate for now unless there would be a compelling reason to do so. The president said he prefers to stay neutral. Nel Maribuhok, UNTV News and Rescue, we serve the people, we give glory to God. Presidential hopeful and Vice President Lani Robredo made a commitment to support the Bangsamoro region all the way under her administration. Meanwhile, a lawmaker has called on Moros to support Robredo as president. This report will tell us why. Presidential candidate and Vice President Lani Robredo continues her campaign in some of the provinces of the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region and Muslim Mindanao or BARM. The vice president visited Barm Compound where she was welcomed by Barm Education Minister Mohager Iqbal and Chief Minister Ahud Ibrahim. There, Robredo vows that she will fully support the region to achieve justice and long-lasting peace should she win as the next chief executive. Should we be given the, the chance to leave this country, um, I will be with you 100%, making sure that all, all, all available um, government help will be at your disposal. The Vice President also attended people's rallies in Cotabato and Basilan. Robredo also shared how former DILG Secretary Jesse Robredo worked on securing peace in Mindanao and how she continued that advocacy by working on the passage of the Bangsamoro Organic Law during her term in Congress. The independent candidate hopes for a repeat victory in the region. In the 2016 elections, Robredo won in several provinces in Barm, including Basilan, Maguindanao, and Tawi-Tawi. Meanwhile, Basilan Lone District Representative and House Deputy Speaker Mojib Hataman endorses Robredo for president. In a statement, the former ARMM governor recognized the kind of leadership and character of Robredo. He also opposes the return to power of the Marcoses, noting the dark chapter that Moro suffered under the Marcos regime. The lawmaker also describes Robredo as the best choice in maintaining peace in the region. He also appeals to the people of Bangsamoro to support Robredo. The Lenny Kiko tandem will be visiting Isabela City in Basilan and Zamboanga tomorrow. Horilin Delgado, UN TV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. The Metropolitan Manila Development Authority, or MMDA, intensifies anew its road clearing operations in the Mabuhay Lanes across the National Capital Region. Asher Kadapan Jr. details why. Traffic in Metro Manila roads are gradually becoming heavier as the economy continues to reopen after the crisis brought about by the pandemic. Subsequently, it becomes more congested during downpours. With this, the Metropolitan Manila Development Authority reinforces its clearing operations to ensure roads are cleared from any obstructions. MMDA Chairman Romando Artes targets to conduct regular clearing operations on all Mabuhay lanes which serve as alternative routes for EDSA. Today, at least 25 vehicles illegally parked in a portion of a Buhay Lane in Quezon City were issued traffic violation tickets or were towed by MMDA personnel just within 30 minutes of their initial operation. They were fined 1,000 to 2,000 pesos for the violation, while towed vehicles were brought to MMDA's impounding area in Tumana, Marikina. Ito po ay para ipakita sa ating mga kababayan na seryoso ang MMDA na paluwagin ang mga karsada, bigyan ng alternatibong daan ang ating kababayan para po mas mobilis ang daloy ng traffic. The MMDA chief says they will conduct the clearing operations daily. He added that the agency targets to clear all mabuhay lanes of any obstructions in the next three months. Ang aming panunungkulan ay hanggang June 30 lamang 
ang gusto po natin ay bago tayo bumaba sa pwesto ay may turn over po natin ang Manila, ang Metro Manila ng malinis at uh, maayos po. Meanwhile, the MMDA says there is still no need to expand the number coding scheme as the vehicle volume is still below the pre-pandemic levels. He also says that the increase in gasoline prices is a possible factor to the lesser number of vehicles traversing EDSA. Asher Kadapan Jr., UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. And for the news abroad, after South Korea's health authorities significantly eased quarantine restrictions and border controls, South Korea on Tuesday recorded the highest number of daily COVID-19 deaths since the start of the pandemic. Marvi Dolphin will give us the details live. Yes, Marvi, go ahead. Mariel, just days after removing the requirements for adults to show proof of vaccination or negative test when entering venues, the East Nation reported 293 deaths related to COVID-19 and 1,196 virus patients in serious or critical conditions, which is also a new high. Though the East Nation's record of fatalities is far lower than the worst daily death tolls reported in Western countries due to high vaccination rates, South Korea's health ministry said it expects the country's hospital system to be strained with the rise in case numbers. In the past seven days, South Korea has reported a daily average of around 337,000 new cases, which represents more than an 80-fold increase from levels seen in mid-January. With 6.4 million added since February, the country's caseload is now over 7.2 million, according to the Korea Disease Control and Prevention Agency, or KDCA. Though health officials assure that the country's medical response was stable after South Korea pushed to expand its resources and now have more than 30 percent of ICU units for COVID-19 patients still available. The recent uptick in infections will present challenges for newly elected President Yoon suk yeol who criticized current President Moon Jae-in's COVID-19 response and has then promised to loosen pandemic-related policies. Muriel? Thank you, Marvid Finn, reporting live. Ukraine's capital, Kiev, is now under a 35-hour curfew, as recently announced by its mayor. Cherise Longboen will tell us why, live. Yes, Cherise, go ahead. Good evening, Marielle. The 35-hour curfew imposed by Mayor Vitaly Klitschko on Ukrainian capital Kyiv is due to Russia's relentless bombardment, causing the destruction of residential areas and civilian infrastructure. The curfew has started on Tuesday evening local time and will end on Thursday morning. Throughout the curfew, Mr. Klitschko said that Ukrainians are prohibited to move around the city without special permissions, except to go to bomb shelters. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky submitted a bill to Parliament to extend the martial law until April 24 and to require 18 to 60-year-old men to stay and fight for the country. Adding to that, President Zelensky continues to appeal for more support from European leaders to counter Russia's invasion. Mariela, the latest, Ukraine saw around 20,000 people fleeing Mariupol, the biggest evacuation yet from the port city. Russian forces retreated after Ukraine's military repelled their attempt to take control of the city. Marielle? Therese, are there any updates on the ceasefire talks between Russia and the Ukraine? Marielle, discussions between Russian and Ukrainian negotiators have recommenced after failing to make a breakthrough on Monday. President Zelensky described the talks as very difficult and a viscous negotiation process. But according to Ukrainian negotiator Mikhail Podolyak, both sides have also expressed some optimism as they would discuss peace, ceasefire, immediate withdrawal of troops, and security guarantees. Back to you, Marielle. Thank you, Cheriz Longboen, reporting live. Russia will be bringing an American astronaut back to Earth despite tensions over the country's invasion of Ukraine. Haselito Likido will tell us the details live. Go ahead, Haselito. Good evening, Marielle. U.S. astronaut Mark Vandihey had fears of being left behind on an international space station, or ISS, 
but is now confirmed to return home on a Russian capsule to Kazakhstan. Mr. Van de Hey will be accompanied by two Russian cosmonauts. NASA's ISS program manager Joel Montalbano said they are currently in talks with Russian colleagues and admitted that the astronauts are aware of the situation between Russia and Ukraine. Under international space law, astronauts from all nations must provide all possible help to other astronauts when needed, including emergency landing in foreign country or at sea. The chief of the Russian space agency's Roscosmos, Dmitry Rogozin, has previously warned about the technical issues that may arise from the sanctions, but Mr. Monsalbano assured that ISS has continued to run smoothly. Aboard the ISS, the U.S. controls power and life support, while Russia controls the space station's propulsion control system. Mr. Van de Hey has been in space for 355 days and now holds the U.S. record for the most time spent in space. Back to you, Muriel. Thank you, Joselita Liquido, for that live report. The Senate unanimously approved a bipartisan bill named the Sunshine Protection Act to finally make the daylight saving time permanent in the United States next year. This will put a stop to changing clocks twice a year for Americans. Senator Ed Markey of Massachusetts, along with other senators from the chamber floor, were positive this will improve public health, the economy, and even save energy. However, this bill to become a law requires further approval from the House, of, House and the signature of U.S. President Joe Biden. The daylight saving time was first adopted in 1942 wartime and the members of the Congress agree that it could potentially be beneficial and cost effective. Possible discussions for legislation was reviewed and passed on to the Energy and Commerce Committee last week. The chairman of the committee, Representative Frank Pallone, agreed that it is time to standardize daylight saving time and nearly 12 U.S. states had done so. Although still undecided between the daylight saving time and standard time to be adopted permanently, he is urging the House of Representatives to expedite the process of the Sunshine Protection Act. And those are the reasons behind the news in other parts of the globe. I am Maria Latoza reporting live from Perth, Australia. Good evening. And before we close, we will leave you with a word, giving glory to God. From the book of Psalms, chapter 118, verse 8, it says, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. And those are the reasons behind the news, March 16, 2022. Reasons we deliver to you as they unfold. I am Harleen Delgado. And because we need to know, we will always ask why. I am William Theo. We serve the people. We give glory to God.